Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, featuring timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. In today's episode, ISF CEO Steve Durbin speaks with Carl Allen, a private equity investor and co-founder of Prox Capital Group and the Dealmaker Wealth Society. Steve and Carl discuss security across the M&A process, particularly for small and mid-sized businesses. Carl, thanks very much indeed for uh, joining us on the podcast. You've been active in deal making for 25 years, probably more. Tell us a little bit about your career. How did you come to get involved in mergers acquisitions? Very interesting, actually. My original goal was to be a structural engineer. Uh, I left university in 1992 having finished top of my class in structural engineering and ended up going into mergers and acquisitions because my housemate, who wasn't as smart as me, was earning four times as much money as a trainee investment banker. So I went to London, went to work for Bank of America in the graduate trainee program. They rotate you through a whole bunch of different units. And I ended up in the M&A space, uh, really enjoyed mergers and acquisitions. I remember the first day my boss sat me down and said, you know, buying and selling businesses, it's just like buying and selling houses, but uh, obviously there's a lot more involved. And I just thought that was really, really cool. So I went into the corporate M&A world. So back in the nineties, you know, technology deals, you know, weren't at the forefront. So I was in what they call the industrial team. So I was doing deals for, you know, GE, Boeing, later lead kind of IBM, Microsoft. And then uh, just got more heavily involved in in technology deals. So I was in corporate M and A, you know, for quite a while. Then I left, went to business school in Chicago, and then had a brief stint in private equity. We invested in a network software company, which we ended up selling to Hewlett Packard, and I went along with the deal. So was in M and A with HP for a number of years. Absolutely loved it. It's fine, you know, when you're told you've you've got a twenty five billion dollar war chest to go and buy up lots of different companies. So that was great. It was all over the world doing deals. And then 1st of February, 2008, so nearly 14 years ago, my life completely changed in the space of about four hours. I was in a boardroom in Moscow with my CEO doing a deal and my phone rang and my wife had gone into labor four weeks early. So I had to get myself back to the UK very, very quickly. And I managed to see my son born about I had five minutes to spare when I when I got into the hospital. I was 38 at the time, financially set up. And I thought to myself, I can't do this anymore. I need to be with my family. And, you know, this was a narrow miss. So I, I retired. I was 38, 37, actually 37 and a bit. And uh, I lasted about three weeks, my brain <laughs> just mush. And about three weeks into retirement, I sat down with my wife one night, I said, what am I going to do? She said, well, you know, you've only got one skill set, buying and selling companies. Why don't you become a business broker? So I did. I became a business broker. But instead of selling the business that I was hired to sell, I ended up buying it. When I was going through the numbers and the process, I realized that I could actually buy this business primarily using other people's money, which is a skill I've learned on Wall Street as an investment banker, but applies just well enough when you're buying a small business. So I bought a transportation company in the north of England, multi-million pound in turnover, very profitable, and raised all the capital to do that deal. And then I sold it about three years later. So I'm still actively doing deals. I'm a partner in a private equity firm on the east coast of the US. But uh, about five years ago, I started to become an influencer and an educator in this space. Lots of people wanted me to coach them on how to do deals, where to find businesses to buy, how to structure and negotiate deals, and obviously where to raise the capital to do those deals so that you don't have to put your own money in, you know, for the most part. So uh, that's what I've been doing. And I I really enjoy that side of my business life, being able to impact people, whether they're entrepreneurs looking to get into business, or more importantly, helping an existing business owner scale via acquisitions. It's what the big companies are doing. You look at Amazon, they're up 13x in their market value in the last seven or eight years. And a lot of that has really come through acquisitions. So there's no reason why a small company can't grow by acquisition, just like the big guys do. And indeed, deal making has been surging around the world at the moment, hasn't it? We've seen as a resurgence of this whole sort of M&A. What's the reason for that? 
I think it depends on the kind of side of the industry that you're in. So, and you know, this is sector agnostic, but if you go into yeah. the kind of public capital markets, you know, if you're Amazon or Microsoft or even, you know, HP, IBM, you're trading at a 30 times multiple. If you can go and buy a business at a 10 times multiple, not only are you growing market share, adding revenue, customers, products and services, you're making your shareholders happy. Because if you buy, you know, whatever profits you're buying, they drop into your bottom line, your share price is going to value them a lot higher. So it's more of a financial arbitrage at the kind of higher end of the market where I primarily play these days, which is in the small and, and medium business market. You know, what's driving it is that businesses want to grow and it's becoming a lot harder to grow a business organically, hustling, you know, to get customers by customer. You know, if you want new technologies, new products and services for your customers, it's taking ages and ages to build them yourself and test them. Why not just go and acquire the company that's doing what you're doing? It's like Amazon many, many years ago, they realized all their book buyers were listening to books on an app called Audible. And Mr. Bezos did sit down with his R&D team and say, okay, guys, let's figure this out. How do we build this technology, market it, package it, and all those things? No, he just went and bought the company that was stealing his market share. And that's what big companies do. And there's nothing to stop small companies doing that as well. The majority of our listeners are cybersecurity professionals. So let's talk about the implications of cyber for M&A. How much of a priority is cybersecurity to you and to the businesses you work with through that acquisition process? In what sort of context, Steve? Well, when I look at most markets at the moment, you know, everybody is is moving, everybody's been impacted by the pandemic, huge amount of what we all refer to as digital transformation, which is more and more technology being used in everything that we do, facilitating the way that we transact business all around the world. And my sort of premise is that if you're using technology, you are running risk when it comes to cyber because you are holding, storing, sharing data and that's of interest and value to a third party who may want to get their hands on it either legitimately or illegitimately. And so if you then put two companies together or you're looking to put two companies together, how do you go through trying to figure out whether or not cybersecurity is something that you need to be focusing on through the M&A process, something that is not perhaps relevant at the beginning, but could be when you come to you know, closing. So what is the role of cyber, if you like, yeah. today in that whole M&A process? Sure. So I, I think you split it into two parts. I think there's pre-closing issues and there's post-closing issues as well. So clearly when you're doing a deal, depending on how big or complex the deal is, ultimately you would go through a process of due diligence. And ultimately as the buyer, you need to satisfy yourself that what you're buying is what you think it is. So there's a ton of legal, financial, taxation and other documentation that you need to have. And what amazes me, what blows my mind even these days is how much of that stuff is shared through apps like Dropbox and Google Drive. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. There are some very, very sophisticated platforms out there that you can utilize to build data rooms, which can have, you know, permission based access on all those different things. Because what's really interesting about deals is a lot of business owners actually put off the decision to sell a business because they're paranoid about information going into the wrong hands. And you know, right. if you're a small business owner and you go to a business broker and you have the broker list your business for sale, you know, out of every hundred people that look at it, 90 or so of those businesses, you know, they're not interested in buying your company. They just want to get access to all the confidential information because then they can potentially hurt you in the marketplace. So for me, right. We're way behind as an industry, the M&A industry, especially at the small level, we're way behind where we need to be in terms of confidentiality and the security of information. It's, it's a major, major problem. I think once you've done a deal as well, I think where a lot of businesses kind of mess up the integration is, you know, they're not actively looking at security. They've got all this really confidential information and, and it's just not accurately secured 
inside of their business. It really is a massive, massive problem. But, you know, for me, pre-deal, as an industry, we need to do an awful lot more with the confidentiality and the sensitivity information. It's an absolute killer. It's interesting you say that, because if I think back to when I was doing deals, so that's before my ISF day, so I'm probably going back now about 12, 15 years, something like that. I would have said that was exactly the situation there. In fact, I can remember doing deals where people would say, whatever you do, do not involve the security guys or the tech guys or anything like that, because it's just going to slow things down. We'll figure it out once the deal is done. And what you're saying is that, you know, roll it forward now, say 15 years, and it hasn't changed that much when it comes to the confidentiality of, why is that? I don't know. I, I think what I would say is a lot of the platforms that are out there, the specialized platforms, they're very, very, very expensive. And I don't know why. You know, they are sophisticated, but why they're so expensive to license. I think that's what's putting a lot of people off. You know, if you're Goldman Sachs or you're IBM, you're going to have these platforms because you can afford to buy them. But if you're a local business broker or you're an accountant or a solicitor that's helping to broker deals, buying that sort of platform can just be very, very cost prohibitive. And I think that's one of the major reasons why, you know, the advent of of Dropbox or Google Drive and Microsoft's OneDrive, those for me in 99% of the deals that I look at, and some of them are 20, 30, 40 million dollar deals, they're still utilizing these kind of free or very, very low cost resources. I think the platform industry needs to do a better job of having lower cost solutions, which still provide those levels of security. I think that's one of the major reasons why we've not seen mass adoption of them in the small and medium space. Right. If we look at the large space, is the same true? Are we still suffering in them? No, it's 13, 14 years since I was doing billion dollar deals or hundred million dollar deals. But yeah, even back then, the level of security was phenomenal. And I can only imagine it's got even stronger, you know, today. And, and I think as well, there's a lot of stuff that I'm reading about blockchain and smart contracts and using those levels of security and the cryptography for a lot of stuff in large deals as well. So, uh, you know, that's permeating other areas of banking as well. But I think, you know, from a small and medium business perspective, we know we're probably 20 years away from getting involved in all that. I would just love to see people using proper, secure, sophisticated data rooms for small deals. But I think the industry needs to make them a lot more affordable for the regular deal intermediaries that, that, that we see in the center of the market. So is the challenge, do you think, accessibility and price rather than understanding of the need for it? I personally believe, yeah, I do. Because I, it's, it's obvious that, because if you go back to the earlier point that I said, you know, one of the reasons why small business owners kind of hang on until the death and, and they don't put their business for sale sooner is I think they're really concerned about their information going into the wrong hands. Right. And I can see a scenario where, so let's say you're a 10 million pound company and you decide to sell mm-hmm. your business and you go to a business broker, they're going to dump your information into some form of data room. And then anyone that signs a non-disclosure, which you and I both know are not really worth a the paper they're written on, a um, hundred companies can get access to all of that data. You know, customer information, pricing information, key employees, how much they earn and in a lot of cases, the intellectual property information about the business, really, really critical, important stuff. And everybody that signs a one sheet of paper can get access to it. And I think that's wrong. And I think that's damaging the industry. Not only is it hurting the businesses through that process, but also I just think affordability is the issue. I don't think it's an ignorance of security inside of the workplace. You know, security has always been huge in the corporate space. I remember Bank of America, the security that we had was just insane. And that's, you know, I'm going back 25 years. It was crazy. And I remember when I was at HP, one of the big projects that we did at HP in the M&A space, and it it spurned, gosh, over $10 billion of acquisitions that I was part of, was this kind of three-way merger of like data center, security and kind of storage technologies into the enterprise. And obviously it's moved on a lot more since then. But even then there was a criticism that really security was just for the enterprise guys. It was for the big companies. It wasn't really for the small and medium business because it just wasn't affordable for them. So for me, it's always been a cost issue. I don't believe it's an ignorance or it's a deprioritization of security. 
as part of the corporate strategy of the business. So one of the things that a lot of chief information security officers tell me is that they find out about a merger or an acquisition once the deal has been done. And then they feel a little bit like they're part of the cleanup crew because they've got to go in there and try to sift through all of this data that's been acquired as part of the overall enterprise that's been brought in. And their frustration is that had they been involved at a much earlier stage, perhaps they would have been able to influence, provide some advice and guidance. Any tips that you've got, any advice for people listening to this who are identifying with that position? or perhaps working for companies that they know are on an acquisition trail, any tips that you can give them to help them get more engaged with that process? Now, I have to say that, of course, they're not going to get involved in every single deal that takes no. place. But how can they get the message across that actually they can be more helpful the earlier they get engaged rather than post-closing? Yeah, I think the problem is more getting them positioned at the right levels of the business to be part of right. the corporate strategy conversation. Because M&A really, when you look at any business in the world, whether it's a massive business or it's a small business, M&A is the owners working on their business, not necessarily in their business. And what I find is that most of the security professionals, they're working more in the business. They don't have that kind of higher corporate strategic viewpoint or role, which means they can get involved in a lot of these things. So I think for me, it's more of positioning. It's more what they're doing in the business rather than, you know, getting part of the process because, you know, it's a no brainer that they should be part of the journey. It's like, you know, a lawyer wouldn't get involved in a deal after the fact they're involved all the way through. You wouldn't do a deal and then send the legal contract to your solicitor and say, what do you think? Did I do okay? It's like, no, they got to be part of it all the way through. And I, I think that the security and the dissemination of the data and making sure that everything is locked up and secure, I think should rank at that level. I think your accountant or your financial advisor, your legal advisors, you've got to put the security professionals in that bucket. I'll tell you a little story. And this is why I think security is so important, even at, you know, where I play down in the, let's call it 25 million and below deal size. So I, I was on a cruise ship about four years ago and, you know, it was late afternoon, the sun was out and I was, I was smoking a cigar on the kind of top deck and I was talking to this guy, he must've been in his seventies, retired guy. And, you know, we just got talking about business and, and he used to own Florida's largest contract carpet cleaning and upholstery cleaning massive business like 60 70 million dollars in revenues and he was telling me about his business and, and all of a sudden he, he got kind of really sad when he was talking about it and what happened was he decided to sell his company he'd listed it with a very reputable business broker and all of his information got kind of hacked and you know put out into the marketplace and the industry just killed him they knew his pricing mm -hmm. strategies they knew all of his top vendors everything and that the guy's business was dead like 12 months later. So instead of selling out for, you know, a nice exit, which would have fueled a, a very happy retirement, the guy left picking up the pieces of a business that was just decimated by the industry. And that happened purely from a security perspective. And this is happening every single day. And it's crazy. You know, people are selling 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar businesses and they're using Dropbox or Google Drive, which, you know, my 13 year old can hack Google Drive. <laughs> um, you know, for me, when you're selling a business, you know, if I was a broker and I'm not, I work mostly on the buy side, I'm a buyer of companies, not a seller. Right. But if I was selling a business, I would tailor, and you can do this in these data room platforms, you can tailor which potential buyer gets access to which potential information. So you can flag potential security risks ahead of time. So let's say you're selling the business and you know who one of the potential buyers is and there are some huge risk elements to that. You can restrict potentially what information that they can see. And I think with cloud computing and technology, that should be a very, very easy thing to do, but it's got to be affordable. And right now, I don't believe that it is. Because I'm obviously not selling businesses, but even in my private equity firm, we use a data room service and it's probably at least $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. to use it you know but we're doing a lot of deals a lot of volume we can afford it but most people can't in fact i'm talking myself into a new 
business opportunity here. I think a low cost <laughs> cloud based thirty to forty dollar per month type service, I think would do very, very well in the data room market. Very, very well. I was gonna ask you actually if you'd thought about setting up one of these. <laughs> Obviously that's gonna be the next thing one of the next things that you move to. Yeah, absolutely. As you you've made the point, you're more interested in the buy side rather than the sell side. Uh, what makes a business more attractive? for you as a buyer? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, beauty, I would always say, is in the eye of the beholder. So a deal that I would find phenomenal could be very, very different to a deal that you would find phenomenal. But every right. deal really needs to tick three boxes. So the process is the same, it's just the variables are different. So the most important thing is it's got to be a deal that strategically relevant. So if you're a software company, crazy example, but you know, don't buy a chemical processing business or a gas station, you know, go and buy a business that can strategically move the needle. Can it give you access to new markets, new products, new services, a bigger market share? Do you go and buy a competitor? Do you go and buy somebody within your supply chain that you can vertically integrate with? Or do you go and buy a complementary business? to leverage yourself into a different market. So the strategic conversation is very, very important. And alongside that, this is a lot more important for larger deals, but it's also somewhat important for small deals, is you've got to get the cultural fit kind of correct. The single biggest killer of deals that don't work out once they complete is cultural mismatch. And I lived mm -hmm. through HP's acquisition of Compaq in 2003, right. which yep. was the biggest cultural mismatch in the history of M&A. You had California Democrats acquiring Texas Republicans, and I won't get into US politics, but that was never going to work. And it didn't. The two businesses just couldn't get along. You know, they couldn't combine. But strategy is important. An attractive deal is something that's going to strategically move the needle for you. It's going to allow you to exponentially grow your business much faster than, you know, going and doing it organically, winning more customers, doing more marketing, all those different things. The second thing that you want to do is you want to acquire the right seller. And I mean, in terms of the people. Right. Obviously, when Amazon or HP go and buy businesses, it's corporations buying corporations. At the small and medium business level, you know, the deals are really done between the people. And you want to find what I call a distressed seller of a good business. So I only buy good businesses, businesses that are growing, that are profitable. But what I'm typically doing is I'm tapping into the ballooning retiring baby boomer market. So if you go into the mm -hmm. States, you've got 10,000 baby boomers retiring like every single day. Right. And a large percentage of them own small businesses. And you've got this weird kind of supply demand curve right now that there's only one buyer for every 11 businesses that are for sale. You know, if you look at North America, sub 10 million in annual revenues, there's over two and a half million businesses for sale right now. And there's only about 220,000 deals that close every single year in that space. So it's definitely a buyer's market. You've got too much supply and not enough demand. There's not enough people out there that either see acquisitions as a way to grow or don't know how to access the capital to be able to close those deals or just don't really understand you know, the process. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. There's a lot of different moving parts to it. And then the third part of a great deal is you want a business that's got some financial DNA. So right. you're, you're looking really for cash flow. Because if it's got cash flow, assets as well are very beneficial. If you've got those financial attributes, then it's very, very easy to go and raise money. It's become even easier to raise money through the pandemic times. And we're still seeing a large echo of that because the governments of the world, particularly in the US and the UK, are underwriting virtually all of the money that banks are lending out to customers, which is phenomenal. You've got in the UK, 80% of all bank funding is guaranteed by the government. You go to the US, it's 90% through something called the CARES Act that was passed earlier this year, which means that you and I are putting our money into a bank. We're getting 0.1% interest. Banks loaning that out at you know 5 to 10%, depending on the deal, 
yet the government's underwriting 80 to 90 percent of the money so if anything goes wrong you know the bank's in the clear so in my 30 years as a deal maker i've never seen so much funding available to do deals it's absolutely crazy but it's great and you think that would push up the multiples it's not you'd think that would bring a lot more people to the market to do deals it's not happening it's crazy you know most business owners don't see acquisitions as a way to grow a small business and and i just don't understand that it's the quickest cheapest less riskiest way of growing any business but most people don't do it why is that let's go back to what i said before i think it's not a very well understood process mm -hmm. most people don't know how to do it most people don't know you know where to get the money from and they, they just, you don't know what you don't know. Most small business owners know how to organically go out and hustle and grow a company. Working on their business and doing the strategic work of acquiring other companies, you know, often isn't just something that they're prepared to do. But, you know, I'm on a mission to change that. You know, that's one of the reasons why, in addition to doing deals, I wanted to become an educator in this space, to coach and mentor business owners, to be able to take the leap and go and find really good businesses to buy that will strategically move the needle, help them understand the process of what they have to go through, how to find businesses, how to build relationships with sellers, how to negotiate, how to value and structure a deal so that it's a win-win, and then how to go and raise the capital to make the deal happen. These are skills that one needs to learn and one needs to master. But once you do, uh, it just gives you another skill set for your toolbox to be able you know to really grow any business one of the pushbacks that i quite often get when i talk to people about this carl because i'm with you i mean you know it is one of the easiest quickest ways to grow a business but one of the pushbacks i get is this fear of losing control so you know here i am i've got a 10 11 million pound business i want to grow it's wholly owned by me at the moment but i have to go and get capital and that means I'm going to have to give up some of that control. So, you know, how's that going to work out? Am I then going to be, you know, elbowed out of my own business is some of the concern. What are the sorts of things that you say to people who come to you with those concerns? Yeah. So, so you're talking about equity capital where you're diluting mm -hmm. your ownership. There are actually three ways that you can finance, you know, any deal. And, you know, most deals will involve a mixture of all three. But in addition to going and raising equity capital, where you're selling a percentage of the business or the deal, where you know the vast majority of funding that's happening right now is really in the debt markets. So remember when I was talking about cash flow, you've got great cash flow coming out of a business, then there's financial institutions all over the world, I'm talking trillions of dollars that will lend into the deal on the strength of those cash flows. So obviously borrowing money rather than selling equity Yes, you've got to comply with covenants and financial rules. However, you're not diluting any of your ownership. And then in a lot of deals, especially the deals that I do, I'm looking for sellers to take some of the risks. So I will never pay 100% of a deal at closing. I always want the seller to carry some of the deal in paper, which I can pay in the future, A, using the cash flows of the business going forward. And then, you know, if we ever have a valuation gap where I think the business is worth less than what the seller does, then sometimes we can bridge that gap through an earnout structure. So we're paying bonus payments to sellers in the future based on some increased financial performance. So if you look at the US market, for example, one of the biggest funders of deals in the United States is the Small Business Administration, the SBA. So they have, you know, the 7A loan program is their biggest loan. It's only valid up to $5 million deals, which you know, if you're paying no more than a five times multiple, it's allowing you to buy a business that's doing a million dollars a year in profits, which you know, is quite a big business. And the SBA will come in and they'll give you 80% of the funding to be able to do that deal, subject to all the things being above board and correct. And then they're asking the seller to carry a 10% piece and then you as the buyer have got to go out and find the other 10%. So if you're a small business right now and through your own leverage of your own resources, it's probably 
easy for you to go and get 10% of the deal. You know, if you're buying a $5 million business, you just need to find $500,000 of your own capital. You might have that sat on your own balance sheet. You might have a line mm -hmm. of credit with your own business. To your point, if you do have to go and raise some equity, then hopefully the equity level is not that high where the investor is not going to have really much control over what's happening. So you're still going to have 80 or 90 percent of the combined equity. You're just going to have a minority shareholder that's putting in some of the capital to allow you to do the deal. But I always see outside investors, they've got to be a value add. You should never go to an investor just for the money. An investor should add some value to your business, whether it's a skill gap that you're plugging, whether it's an experience level that they're bringing to the table, or whether it's a network that they can leverage. So I have a student in Australia and he's doing a roll up. So he's rolling up lots and lots of different businesses in a particular industry and he's in the medical industry. So he's buying up like Steve, we would call GPs in the UK. Mm -hmm. He's buying okay. up medical centers in Australia and he's done his first seven deals, did it entirely with debt financing and seller financing. But now he's at the stage where he wants to go bigger and he went and, and found a chairman who gave him a chunk of equity. So he sold a percentage of his business. So mm -hmm. given up a little bit of control, but that chairman has done exactly what Kevin's about to do in his former career. So not only has he got the capital to help him do more deals faster, he's bringing on board somebody that's got a wealth of experience and expertise in the market that he's in. So I think you've always got to look at an investor as somebody that's not only providing capital, that's going to add massive value. And then it really kind of helps you with that trade off. Fantastic. Carl, some really interesting insights there and, and lots of really helpful tips for anybody, I think, who's either looking to buy, looking to sell, or indeed who is part of a process that's ongoing. So thank you very much indeed for sharing those insights. It's been, been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Listeners, if you found this discussion interesting, I'd encourage you to take a look at the show notes where we link to some of ISF's resources in the mergers and acquisitions space, including their recently published research paper, Information Security in Mergers and Acquisitions, as well as a video of ISF analyst Richard Absalom's March 2022 presentation on this topic. Thanks so much to this week's guest, Carl Allen. Next week, we speak with Brett Baranek, Vice President and General Manager of Security and Biometrics at Nuance Communications. Here's a preview. What has transpired in the, on the technology side has been the introduction of deep neural networks, which has allowed us to leverage technology to find minute voice characteristics and to understand the relationship between those voice characteristics, which, you know, quite frankly, if you had a bunch of PhDs trying to figure that out manually, it just wouldn't be possible. And so that's really been the technological revolution that's allowed us today to be able to identify a person by their voice with as little as half a second of speech, which is truly, you know, for those of us who have been following, you know, the biometric space is just, it's just a phenomenal leap forward because we've gone from minutes of audio to, to half mm -hmm. a second. We'll be back for the full conversation in a week. In the meantime, is there a topic or question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode? Let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find that catalog of past video and podcast episodes, as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. Follow us on LinkedIn by searching CEO Steve Durbin or Security Forum. Follow our audio feed wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And if you like the ISF podcast, we'd love it if you'd write us short review and if you'd rate the podcast. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with music by Alexander Filipiak, associate producer Katie Flood, mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening. <laughs>